don't want to get close to death. There is an almost talismanic fear of having some of it rub off. It takes an artist to lead the public into the subject matter, very difficult subject matter. When we hung the show, the very first comment was, oh my God, are you really putting that up and what are people going to say? It was so powerful people collectively reeled in, I don't want to say shock, but amazement. You can see their, their anguish or their, their sorrow. But you can see all the wrinkles in their faces. So capture that with fabric. Yeah, fabric and stitches. I mean, when you stand back and it looks more like a painting until you get close on it. Fear. I hate death. I hate it. We don't want to experience it, and we don't want to face facts, but it's reality. I mean, it really conveys a depressing feeling. But all these people do have support systems, so that's one good thing. That's what I really love about her stuff, is that even in the midst of the suffering, these genuine moments of tenderness that might not be there otherwise. You're looking at death, but you don't feel, oh my God, she's dying. You know, but you can feel the light, the, the, good, the good part of it. All the, the good juices are flowing out. When does the threat of life become the threat of death? I mean, there's the continuity between life and death is so fragile, and that's where the tingle goes up your spine. When you look at it, and then you're forced to think about the subject matter, which, as I said, I don't like to do. Coming from his chest, and he's he's dying. See, it's it's connected. Maybe that's taking his pulse, or this one, and and he's dying. It's it's something that really really needs to be seen by everybody, all generations, the baby boomers, because your turn is coming before you know it. <laughs> you people are getting old. Not just me. Right. You're getting old just as fast as I'm getting older. She makes you face reality that you don't want to face. It's heartbreaking, but I'm not afraid when I look at her work. It's very important. I think the Buddhists speak about this a lot. You know, to prepare yourself for the next life by thinking, by meditating on it. I was right next to my father when he died, and it was so excruciatingly painful on the one hand. On the other hand, I would never, ever, ever change a moment of that, and thank goodness I was there. And I think it's, that's the way it is with all of these people in these works. They are in such pain, but yet they, they would not be any place but exactly where they are. It makes me a little less afraid of death, especially if I can be lucky like these people and have love around me. You know, the elderly are not one group, they're a large collection of individuals, all who have their own particular needs and desires and fears and hopes. Deidre's images are remarkable. Her aesthetic eye is able to really perceive the humanity within these people's faces and 
Although the image that I end up seeing is a static image, it somehow is alive. Their humanity shows through. The elders in my community, in my neighborhood, were aware of us as kids. They would invite us in to have tea and cookies. They would show us their collections. We would hear their histories. And this wonderful relationship would go back and forth. And I've noticed that as people get a greater framework of life, they slow down. There's this way in which there is more time to do that. I almost look forward to that part of my aging when I can really focus. I didn't grow up around elderly people. I had no exposure to them. I had no grandparents that I remember. And my parents didn't talk about their parents at all. I just didn't have any experience with elderly people. And now that I am one, I kind of realize that they're not all from a different planet, you know. I think people deceive themselves that elderly people are boring. It's almost as if people can't slow down enough to be where elderly people are, and then if people can slow down enough, it's an amazing place to be with people. There is something about sitting with somebody who's in that slowed down time that allows you to slow down and get a, a really wonderful perspective of your own life about what matters, what our priorities are. There is such a richness in their stories, in their faces, in their characters. There is so much wisdom in what people have experienced in their lives. Being an elder has a really uh, positive connotations to it. It implies wisdom and experience and having sort of a status in the community and, and being looked up to. And, and then elderly, uh, I think, has a connotation of being a little bit uh, decrepit and fragile and uh, uh, not so positive connotations. I think for me as a young child, I just loved old people. Just loved the way they looked and being near them. There's great wealth there. There are great gifts. We've known each other a long time and I've never talked to Didi. I've never heard her say anything about why she chose to go that way and why she, she continues to kind of focus on, on the elderly and images of the elderly. Uh, it just seemed like kind of an odd specialty for an artist who works in textiles. Well, I see it as beautiful. I mean, I, I've been amazed at my own stereotypes and an aged face, a face that has the lines of years and the history written into it is absolutely beautiful to me. They've seen the life cycle so many times. They've had tragedies. They've seen them heal. They've seen young people face up against difficulty and come through it. They've just seen the fact that everything passes and things return and things pass. And I think that's an amazing perspective to hold. As I sit with people who are elderly, I'm often aware that they are elderly to me, but from behind their eyes, the world is just the world. It, they are still the same person that they were really as a child, but also as a you know teenager, a young adult, a middle-aged adult, and a senior citizen. And, and the fact that they're elderly now is part of a continuum
I'm just seeing one snapshot of it. You know, I'm 73. I feel that uh, I'm probably more comfortable with myself at this stage of life than I was in earlier stages of my life. I, I seem to have sort of accepted myself more and and I'm willing to sort of uh, flow with things and, and sort of roll with the punches and be accepting of, of uh, others and, and myself. My mother-in-law used to say, oh, growing old is hell. And I think she was really referring to the ways in which your body just betrays you and abandons you and falls into all kinds of problems. And it's just one thing after another you know, that you're having to deal with. So there's definitely two sides to growing old. <laughs> I think we remain a very youth-oriented society. Uh, we are continuing to emphasize the cultural values of beauty and vitality and productiveness and the quality and quantity of one's possessions. And the qualities that are associated with age, and particularly advanced age, of frailty and, and slowness and some degree of needing assistance and physical dependence are all uh, undesirable qualities in the ambient culture. As people age and become more frail and vulnerable, they are less able to advocate for themselves and more at risk of being ignored, forgotten. I've noticed that dying of a full life is still a rather taboo subject. There's a lot of information and a lot of visualization of dying violently, whereas most of us, over 85% of us, are going to actually live a full life. Every one of us have to take our first breath and to take our last breath. And we spend very, very little time looking at that and seeing it in the uh, reality, the, the f real form that it will take. In our culture, death is the final failure where you could look at it as the final healing. When everything is done and your body is no longer comfortable and you're no longer able to sustain easy breathing and your um, next best thing is to leave, <laughs> you know? <laughs> it's sort of like at that point, moving on is the final healing of the body and of the spirit. I don't like to be reminded of illness and death and disability and parts falling off. People don't, don't want that kind of art on their walls. I mean, I don't look at it and say the art is wonderful, that the, the, uh, the technique is brilliant, the, the colors are excellent, but the subject matter isn't something I really want to see. And why would I look at that if I can look out the window and see nuthatches and chickadees and and uh, all that kind of stuff. A lot of people will say, oh, you poor thing, your work is so depressing. You know, like, how can you continue to do this and how, how can you stand it? Why are you focused on death? Isn't this morbid? When will you do, you know, children and lovely young people? And what is awkward to put into words is the feeling that you've actually witnessed something miraculous. This absolute preciousness of one person, a soul of spirit leaving, an energy that you won't see in that configuration ever again. You only have what you can remember of it. You, you only have that person in your heart. There's a Latin phrase, nascentes morimer. 
and it means from the moment we're born, we begin to die. I think that most of the work and the process of dying happens at an unconscious level. And that's why art speaks to it in a way that words often can't. Initially, hospice will introduce me to a family and I get invited in. And that's always amazing to me, to have um, this invitation to something so intimate and so, so dear as somebody's final days. It feels like such an important responsibility to witness and record their dying, their death. And that sort of astonishes me that I, you know, I feel the moment of truth when I get there and then I can relax and just get into it. So I'm gonna start a new one today. All right. I think it'd be great to get some of that green in here from your jacket, but I don't have them. <laughs> I have to come up with it. I think that Deidre really sees from a part of her mind that puts judgment aside and sees what's there in front of her. So when she sees someone who's dying, she's not seeing her own fears. She's seeing, perhaps, who that person is. When I'm bedside, I try to just be as open and supportive and listening as I possibly can, because that person's death and their priorities are so much more important than any of my own beliefs. Sixty years ago, I was in med school. You were in med school? I did. I went to section. The human dissection, this reminds me of it. It's very good. When I think of my dad, I think of him in his hat. You know, he always says right. to me, I'm going to live to be 100. It's so, it's so uh, amazing, Monday, I'll be back just the difference. Yep. between when he's in the chair with his hat on and when he's in the bed. So, and he, what about your pillow? It's like two different people. So you're not quite so I couldn't believe the change in him. Hi. All right. It was like he imploded. It wasn't a, a stroke or anything like that. He just went from being external to being internal. And I really thought that he had just days. He, he, he said, there's, no, there's not going to be any more art. I'm not going to draw anymore. I'm, he, he gave me his sketchbooks. He said, you take those. That ability has been the, the focus of his life. I mean, that's been the current that's run through his life from the time he was an adolescent. It must be very hard for him to have had to stop the thing that has given his life meaning. And, and uh, even though that's a reality, yeah. that's not how he sees himself. He sees himself like this. I want to take that one into my studio. Mm -hmm. I want to turn that into the fabric. That was an incredible session. Thank you. So we'll work on a, another one. All right. We are you available in about two days? I have to go down to Boston. Then when I get back, can I see you again? Sure. All right. You're looking great.
I have never had a life-threatening illness to this point, but, um, but I hang out with people who are dying on a regular basis and have for years asked them to help me understand their experience. People who are seriously ill experience multiple losses. In one sense, the, the experience of illness is a sequence of losses and being forced to adapt to an ever-changing set of symptoms and limitations. People also suffer from a loss of all that they had been able to do. Uh, if they know that this diagnosis is incurable, they often will suffer from a loss of their future. Part of who we are is our sense of a future. We humans are prone to suffer the loss of our roles in our professional lives, in our family life, in our you know, social life. If you can no longer be the breadwinner for your family, can no longer cut the grass or shovel the snow, that, that was always your job, or can no longer fix dinner for the family, or whatever it is, that's a real source of suffering for people. If a doctor said to me, tomorrow, uh, you've got some disease and, and you're probably going to die in two years, I would probably be very seriously depressed. So I'd react to the prospect of my death, much like a lot of people do. But it's not the death that bothers me, it's the, it's the, the no prospect. It's the no fun in the future. That's pretty scary. People often will suffer this sense of impending annihilation, almost an existential sense of annihilation, that I won't be here anymore. So just if we just reflect on how hard it is, how painful is the grief of losing someone we love, and realize that for the person dying, that grief is multiplied across everyone that they know and love. The immensity of that grief is, is really remarkable. To be in this world, many of us are conflicted. I mean, I think that's the basic human psyche is conflicted. It wants to be individual, and it wants a sense of connection. And I think as we approach death, these ideas, perhaps on the unconscious level, become clearer, and they become closer to our consciousness, or what we're aware of, and this is where a lot of fear kicks in. Uh, while death is beyond life, dying is a part of living. From the person's perspective, or the family's perspective, there, there is something of value during this time of living that we call dying. The notion is that you can become well or remain well within yourself even as your body is dying. I see me raising the question of what life is by using the focus of death. There is such a, a, a miracle to the fact that we are having a conscious, living experience. You know, is it just a dream? What is it? What is it? And that this work, these series on death, raise that issue over and over again. A computer engineer was looking at the cover of American Journal of Nursing, and it had one of my pieces on it. And Five seconds, he went through this entire revelation. He went from, this is really repulsive, to why am I thinking this is repulsive, to wow, she is doing this incredible thing, she's dying, 
And then finally to, oh my God, this is beautiful. On an unconscious level, death is very important to each of us, that ultimate loss of self, of individuality. And this influences so much of what we do, almost everything, perhaps. To step in and say, I'm going to be with you, when you're dying is an opportunity to look at our own fear around loss and death. And I think the biggest fear that comes up for people around death is the fear of being alone. You know, there are worse things than dying. The, the main obvious worst thing than dying is dying badly. Uh, and part of dying badly is often dying feeling abandoned or feeling that no one cares, feeling isolated and alone. You know, the person who dies in a hospital room with a TV on is, is from my perspective, really a, a place of where we have failed. In contrast, a person who dies from the reluctant arms of community, dies having been waked out of life with family and friends around them, from my perspective, feels like a success. I think in this work, you do sometimes meet people who have accepted that their time is done and they're ready to move on. And other times you meet people who really are not ready and you feel resistance and you feel the struggle. This man was really uncomfortable with his dying. He was agitated and angry and fearful and having a very, very difficult time. So we went in and he was lying on the couch. He was a tight, curl, his hands were fists, his face was clenched, his jaw was clenched, he was curled into himself, and we sang down to the valley to pray. And when we finished singing, he said, can I get a copy of that? <laughs> and I thought, he liked it. And so we moved a little bit closer, and we sang a few more songs, and every song we sang, we moved closer to him, and he, uh, he started to just unfold. The nursing staff was outside the door looking in, saying, what happened? <laughs> and by the time we left, he was completely relaxed, his head on the pillow, his eyes were closed, his hands had opened, and um, we sang angels hovering round, right around his bed, and, and we all left feeling so blessed by that experience. There are angels hovering round there are angels hovering round. There are angels, angels hovering round to carry the tidings home. To
We are part of the hospice palliative care, offered as another end-of-life care. And what we do is we go to people's homes or hospitals or nursing homes, and we sing around the bedsides of people who are dying. was born, actually, when Dinah Brunig died. And one of the things that Dinah's illness and, and death enabled us to do is to model a different way of dealing with illness and death. And that is the modeling that we did, was just being open about talking about things that people sometimes are uncomfortable talking about. Little did I know when I suggested to Peter that we might get a few people to sing, that he would send out an email and that every possible person that knew how to sing in the Brattleboro area showed up in their tiny little house. She hadn't spoken, and but she did seem to come to life and she responded so strongly to the singing. She was actually singing with us and she kept asking for more songs. Some of them just asking specifically, oh, I want to sing The Waters of Babylon. Or, By the waters of Babylon, where we it was uh, a beautiful experience. Several people told me that they'd never been in a situation like that where someone was actively dying. And it was, they just were incredibly moved by the, by the experience. Everybody's death is completely different. And her process was to say, do it with me. I, I would like a lot of people around me sharing love. One of the important things I think when someone's dying is that you want to be able, to, that you know, you want to be able to say goodbye to them in a way that has meaning. And this is, and it's so hard to say, use the words to say goodbye, I'll never see you again, but do it in a singing way. It just felt like we were doing this together with her. It sort of took away the fear of death. I mean, it, it was incredible to see somebody who was so happy. Um, as happy as a clam, as she said, and know that she was going to die. I still have joy, oh yes, I still have joy. After all the things I've been through, I still, I still have joy, I still have joy. The singers were not hospice workers. When we started Hallowell, uh, one of the challenges for us was how do we make a bridge between the hospice world and the singing world? Everybody was really excited about the idea, but also very nervous about it. What would it be like to go to a death? What would it be like to see somebody dying? What should I expect? The sights, the sounds, the smells of a dying person's room are really quite different, and that is something that I think takes a little while to get used to. But part of my interest in this and my wanting to do this is to just be more comfortable with that, just to understand that you know there is a part of life that is the end of life, and we're all going to experience that in some way. I've certainly sung with choruses 
and there's an excitement. There's an excitement of performing and uh, even a nervousness that comes with you want to sing it just right and you want to sound just right and this is totally different. It's not about singing it right for an audience. It's really about being being totally present with the people who you're singing it for and wanting it to be a gift. If I had to give up all the other singing in my life, this is the one that I would keep. It's just such an honor to be invited to a very private family situation and to offer song. Well, that's like being invited to be an angel, and who wouldn't want that? <laughs> You're wonderful. Thank you for inviting us in. Oh, I'm so glad you came. We'll come again, okay? Oh, please come. One of the great gifts of Hallowell is that the singers have become more and more comfortable with death. Come again, come again. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. I'll be, now, I'll be dressed next time. All right. <laughs> Often we leave feeling really joyful, which is one of the things I've learned more and more about this work, is that there is a place for celebration and joy in our grief work. I've heard so much about you. The whole experience of dying is a very real experience. And it makes us aware of how much of our lives are lived in a kind of false environment where people are wearing masks. We're not saying what we really think and feel. And all of that is stripped away when you go into a place where someone is dying. Nobody is really putting on any airs. They can't. No. <laughs> Thank you. I can't applaud. That's okay. No, that's a, you don't, you don't that's perfect. Applaud. We don't need applause. <coughs> we don't even want applause. <laughs> I think that our grief often is something we hide. We we don't want to show the world. We we think we should be over it soon, and it really has its own rhythm. People can grieve for a long time and in many different ways, and it comes and goes. It has a real flow to it. If you can have that experience and not have it be blocked or put down or sort of rejected by the people around you, saying, oh, get over it, you know, if you can really do it, then it, I think, inevitably leads to uh, acceptance and to uh, a fuller understanding of your life and to being able to move on and embrace life. We are a culture that sort of masks our emotions and hides our feelings and you know I'm not sure why that is because you would think you would want people to understand how you feel and would want to understand how they feel but I think there is that that opening up that sort of release that happens doing this work where you realize that the emotions are really important and it's it's okay to show them. When my father passed away there was a lot of confusion, as there often is, uh, about how much time somebody has left. Somebody from the hospital showed up in the room and, and uh, started being very businesslike about things. And, and I said, is there a number I can call for hospice care? Because I had just started getting involved in, in this hospice group. They looked at me like I was you know, <laughs> insane, that there was, there was nothing they were going to be able to do for me. 
And, and it felt just so lonely, the three of us sitting there in that room. And, when he, and after he passed, we just walked out, just walked out of the hospital. In fact, disease and, and its treatment often inadvertently isolate people from their community. And, and the medical system tends to have over-incorporated this sort of Jeffersonian notion of individuality, which works well in, the, in civic society, but really does not really well match the, the biology and psychology of the human condition in which we're intimately connected, inextricably connected to other people. Community is part of what it means to be human. We're social animals. That's the anthropology of our condition is such that we are inevitably part of community. Last week we did a sing in, in this hospice room in Brattleboro and it was beautiful. It was this couple by themselves with their mother and um, she was very close to dying within 12 hours of dying and we came in and it was just, I think it just, created this space for them and this honoring of her life in a way that that didn't happen for my father. I didn't lead us to sing it with you then because I was singing the wrong part, which is why I couldn't get it. Let's do that first again. We're ready to go in though. Let's just do it. The places that we're invited into are places where people have accepted more easily that this person is dying and they're trying to make it a, a more comfortable passing. They've taken some responsibility, they've made some choices. There's some empowerment around helping their loved one die. The work of Hollowell is therapeutic in, in many ways. For one, it's just a gift of beauty in people's lives. And so often when people are seriously ill, their lives are filled with one stress after another. The person who comes in to, to stick their finger to check their blood glucose, or the, the next pill they have to take, or the catheter, or the dressing change, what, whatever it is. And so often they have lost the things of beauty that once filled their lives. I've got music all the way through me, but I get sick and lost a lot of it, so this is really means a lot. You don't mind a mix of lively and quiet? Oh, no, no. So you want a lively one? Yeah. Okay, then hold on to your wheelchair. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> walk, walk, walk. Oh, what a glorious sight appears to our relieving eyes. The earth and seas are passed away. The earth and seas are passed away. And here, uh, through the intention and the discipline of their craft of singing, is a way of conveying this beauty to someone, to really gift them, almost anoint them with this gift of song. It is this sense of connection that is that they are also bringing to the person. And in all honesty, connection is the ground substance of therapeutics. One of the things I do before a sing is I make contact with the family and I talk to them about their spiritual practices, their religious practices, their beliefs, music they've loved. And in doing that questioning, I have a really good sense of what we can bring. Do we want to sing about Jesus with this family? Is this a Christian family? And is that going to be a comfort? Or do we sing songs in other languages? Do we sing folk songs? Do we sing traditional music? Whatever the family needs, what they've practiced in their life what they know is what we what we bring in and we have a huge repertoire to choose from so that we can bring whatever is needed
Thank you so much. So much. <laughs> Beautiful. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
the end of life to be. It's not about caring for the dying as if they're not us. It's about reclaiming the end of life for ourselves and our family and our friends and our communities. This is a part of living. Our, our life doesn't end when we are quote unquote dying. In fact, it's a valuable time of life that really we need to reclaim. We have the opportunity to perhaps put our projections aside, our, our own fears about growing old, our own fears about our body hurting or, or decaying, our own fears around death and loss, and to really listen to somebody else. That kind of listening can just remind us of the part that's the same as them that's exactly the same as them. What do you think happens when we die? I think when the person dies, both the soul and the spirit the spirits are released to leave. return to the spirit world. I guess I feel a sense of hope that it would be a peaceful... I don't know. I don't know. Joyful thing, and I would hope we'd meet again. Well, I'd like to believe that there's a peaceful passage to another place. It seems to me that there are loving presences in the I room. don't believe in afterlife or, or anything like that. I have that. more tendency to believe in reincarnation. And, and being dead, obviously, to me, is to be oblivious. It'll be a, one of the great uh, adventures. Loving arms waiting to hold You know, them. I have no idea what happens when you die. I say that respectfully. Well, I think you know, it's I have... the ultimate mystery. I don't know, and I think I also don't want to know. I want it to but be I've a mystery. I've never been convinced that anyone really knows, at least anyone. And I myself knows. don't believe in heaven. I think earth is heaven. Whatever form God has taken for a person in their life. Re-engage the nitrogen cycle that at some point. That form will come and be welcoming and be light-filled. It's, it's the great mystery, and I really just have no I idea. I think the physical energy stays. And it's possible and that, that it will be a nothingness. That the love does the same thing. I have full confidence that it's a pretty wonderful thing to do to die, and I can get pretty excited Things about are, it. are quiet and peaceful. There's nothing to fear. And I know that I'm dying uh, to think, okay, now what's next? Home, sweet low, sweet stereo, coming for to carry me home. Friends. <laughs> <laughs>